and through the assembled throng goes the electric question. Who is that figure on the stage? Who is this mysterious person? Is it Dr. Jekyll? Or <laughs> is it Mr. Hyde? Which is a good question. Uh, there is uh, no, uh, I, I don't even think there's any doubt any longer about the efficacy of the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde uh, syndrome in our world. Uh, you know, in the days when Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was written, it was considered just a bit of fancy. It was considered uh, one of those uh, odd little pieces of imaginative literature. And yet, I don't know whether I should bring this up with women and children listening at this hour. Yet, uh, the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde dream is with all of us. Would you prefer to be Dr. Jekyll? Do you remember Dr. Jekyll? Or would you prefer Mr. Hyde? It's a very hard question to answer, you know. At, at offhand, if back in the Victorian days, of course, everyone knew they wanted to be Dr. Jekyll. No question about that. Now I'm not so sure. Would Dr. Jekyll make it big on the David Susskind show? I doubt it. Unless he was only there to report on Mr. Hyde. And Mr. Hyde, of course, would be the subject of the discussion. Mr. Hyde, as a matter of fact, would be Mr. Susskind. Perhaps is. <laughs> Uh, well, where, where, where do we stand here in this issue? You know, maybe you don't know the story. Maybe you don't know. You must have seen it on on late late movies, uh, and and the idea, of course, of converting yourself instantly, magically, into another being, has always sort of lingered on the outskirts of the human fantasy world. That, of course, is, it all stems from one basic premise: we all secretly think that the I. The person we are is rotten. <laughs> it's inadequate. It's uh, ridiculous. It's, uh, well, it's just shoddy. That's all, you know. And if somehow you could go down to the drugstore and buy the magic potion, mix it up, apply a little heat, drop in just a little touch of sugar, shh, boom, and it bubbles and steams and hisses, boom. And you read the instructions on the bottle. It says, take two doses, three hours apart, and then stand back. Do not allow this to be used in the presence of children. Keep it out of reach of the little ones, the dogs, your pet parakeet, else you have an eagle in your house. Arrgh. Wow! Well, speaking of the parakeet world, here are the commercial announcers. Well, since time immemorial, the uh, the Mr. Hyde's among us, uh, the the uh, the Superman, if you will. Uh, you know, there are many kinds of Superman. Don't don't think for a minute that Superman only means a man who is bigger than anybody else, physically. You know, there's the physical Superman. And then there's the Superman in the old Greek god concept who goes beyond and somehow lies outside of the pale of the normal mores that bind the earthlings, uh, one to the other, to civilization. In other words, a drug addict can be a kind of Superman, uh, a, 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 a footpad, a, a robber, a second story man is vaguely a Superman because he has broken through that that glass ball of morality, uh, society, the structure of uh, accepted conventional behavior codes. It's another kind of Superman, you see. And then, of course, there is a third kind of Superman, and that's the Superman who can control others. There's three types, you know. The one type, of course, is the Superman who controls by pure physicality. He hits people. Uh, he's the Superman of the Genghis Khan type. Uh, he's the Superman of the uh, the tackle for the Green Bay Packers. Uh, he can he can just run run over people. Then there is the Superman of stealth. Uh, this is the uh, well, this is the head of the mafia. 
This is one of the reasons why we all sit and are vaguely impressed by the Capones, vaguely intrigued by the lucky Lucianos. Uh, we don't quite know whether we hate them or not. They sit there beyond the pale. Now, that's the Superman of stealth. And then there is the third and last and most difficult of all. The Superman of hypnotic power. The Superman who bends other men's wills to their desires like rubber bands. The Superman of the balcony overlooking the vast lumberless masses standing with ready applause at their fingertips. The Superman who leads all the lesser creatures over the cliff. Vast, vast herds of sheep. The Superman, the bell cow, the one who carries the scepter. Yeah. Now, this is, of course, the one we all secretly want to be. Ain't no question about it. Now, <laughs> uh, you know, people are constantly wondering. Uh, I'm always amazed. I really am. I'm surprised at the naivete of so many right-thinking people. Uh, you know, people who write the nice liberal poems and who write nice liberal essays, they, came, they seem to be constantly surprised and dismayed at the rise of dictators. They, they never seem to realize, you know, they, they seem to think this is, a, this is one of those tricks uh, of, of nature that suddenly happened here. At this, and, they, and they usually define it as the fault of one given people. They'll say, well, now, you know, that bunch of people over there, they have a, they have a real thing about it. You know, they're always, a, they, they do, you see, they, they isolate it. They like to say that the dictator who rises is a kind of sociological sport as opposed to a biological sport. This is just one of those flukes of nature. And yet, all the way back through recorded history, and certainly beyond that, it must have gone, there were these guys. Uh, always, they're always there. I wonder how many people who were in the in the army or during World War II and that, who felt that uh, when the war was over, there'd be no more dictators. And, you know, th th this is just an accepted assumption. It was just a fact, you know, everyone thought that. And yet I would suspect that there are more dictators today, operating dictators today, than there were at the end of World War II. I mean, really operating dictators. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about guys that can pull strings, man. Uh, and, and can make heads roll, make the troopans march. Uh, there are probably more operating dictators today than there were then. As a matter of fact, you, uh, I, I suppose you're aware that every Iron Curtain country has its own local dictator. Uh, Albania, they all have a guy who's standing up there on the balcony somewhere. Now, he may be under the super dictator, who is often the main office of dictators. Uh, but nevertheless, <laughs> in his own bailiwick, he's in charge. And and I would like to see, wouldn't it be a fantastic panel show on some late-night TV panel-type show, you know, get all the dictators of the world, have a convention, you know, dictators. They discuss methodology, you know, techniques and problems common to all dictators. And uh, can you imagine this group sitting there with their burning eyes, their hypnotic will, their fantastic ego, all 19 of them sitting around the table, presided over by uh, David Suskind. And of course, David, with his nice, soft, kind of spongy, easy way, says, well, now, fellas, now look, all of you fellas know that uh, what you're up to is... <laughs> oh, boy, human nature being what it is. I can hear the clatter of cloven hoofs off in the distance there. Speaking of the cloven hoof brigade, now everybody, everybody believes. He, he really. Uh, this is a, this is a belief that we all kind of hold. We kind of cherish this belief uh, that we don't like dictators. We don't like to believe that. Well, what we really don't like really about dictators is that we aren't one. Uh, <laughs> this is a. Uh, this is the same problem that, you know, comes about when you see kids standing around on the, on the uh, library steps and they all say they don't like baseball players. 
Well, <laughs> they all say they don't like football players. Well, uh, it's a moot question whether they don't like football players or whether they don't like the fact that they weigh 105 pounds and have, uh, have bifocals at the age of 10. That could have a little bit to do, or are just plain chicken. You know, many a guy walking around has the body and he has the he has the uh, the desire to play football, but he's got big chicken feet sticking out of out of his knickers. You know, walking around, and, <laughs> and it's very hard to uh, you know to admit that when you sit there in the library and and your talk comes out in the form of clucks. You know, cluck, 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 quack, quack. And uh, every time you write for the literary magazine, you're not really writing; you're laying eggs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which you sit upon and hope will hatch into great ideas. However, uh, this, uh, this, is a, this is an age-old thing, this, this idea of becoming a Superman. And I remember one of the very first ads I used to really be hung up on was the ad that came down at the bottom of, of comic books and comic strip pages, way down at the bottom. You know, it shows this guy lying on the beach, and uh, this other guy is kicking a sand in his face, you know, and the chick is lying on the on the the rug there next to him, and the next thing you know, uh, she is looking at him very disappointedly. And you see this big loud saying, Ah, oh, come on, get up and fight it. You think you're so smart about it? He kicks more sand in, uh, in Ollie's face. And the next picture, of course, we see the chick going off with this big lout, and they're heading towards the hot dog stand. And Ollie is left alone to ponder and to stew in his own juice. And the next scene, we see Ollie reading, uh, guess what? He's reading uh, Superman comics or some other deep-thinking organ of the day. And uh, he comes across the very ad that you're reading. And he is sitting in his room, of course, looking harassed and wan and tired and unhappy. And he says, by George, I think I'll send in the coupon. Just seven minutes a day. Yes, I will. You, too, from a 97-pound weakling can become. And he sends in the coupon, and we see... The next scene, the mailman is delivering the uh, the stuff to him. He says, gee, Charles. And already we notice Charles, is, uh, his eyes are a little brighter. You notice that? He's a little fuller around the cheeks, even as he's taking the envelope from the mailman, because he's on his way, you see. And sure enough, in the next scene, which is, of course, the big scene, we see him standing next to the wall, and he's got some kind of a spring thing that he's got holding, uh, holding over his head, you know, with the springs and all that, and he is bulging all over. He says, by George, I never knew it was so easy to become a hard-hitting, tough man of sinewy muscles. And he's pulling around, you see his neck. And in the last scene, we see him now kicking sand in the face of a smaller individual on the beach. He has made the full transition. Da, 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 da. Well, fellow sand kickers, or are you a kicky? Which is it, friend? <laughs> well, uh, speaking of getting sand kicked in your face, here it comes again. Well, of course, uh, now, now we've entered a new era. We've entered a new age, and no longer do we think of the muscular man as the superman. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, it's the, well, we don't even think of the mus the brain man, you know, that was in the 30s. No, I'm sorry, Matt, uh, really, I'm sorry, Mike, that the, in, the, in the 1930s and in the 40s, it used to be rise above your fellow man by becoming well-read. That was back in the days when they would sell the five-foot shelf of books. Uh, read the five-foot shelf of books and be the fantastic star at the cocktail party. Uh, discuss with, uh, discuss Veblen, you know, come out with the Thoreauian remarks. And that was another kind of Superman. Remember that? That was, a, that was another age. Also, during that period, there was the Superman of the piano keyboard. Uh, they left when I sat down to play the piano. However, <laughs> then the next scene, of course, all the girls are mad to know with this guy who's playing, yes, sir, that's my baby, no, sir. Uh, I, this, was, this was another type of superman or developmental stage of the man who wanted to ascribe or somehow cling to the little shirt tails of power. He wanted to make it. What do you think is now, right now, what are they selling to guys now in the mid-60s? Come on. Come on, we're all part of it. What is the number one thing that all writers write about, that all uh, writers, and it has nothing, well, of course, it has peripherally to do with sex, but what is the one thing that all major writers are interested in? 
What was Holden Caulfield interested in? Himself. Nothing else. Himself. Now we have emerging very, very slowly, but very definitely, the Superman of the Ego. Yes, gone is the Superman of muscle. Gone is the Superman of knowledge. Gone is the Superman of banjo playing. Now we have the Superman of Ego. Out Holden, your neighbor. Be more sensitive than thou. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, now, of course, uh, like all of these, uh, like all of these problems at any given time, guys don't know how to do it. That, that's a hang-up, you see. Uh, and so, naturally, Charles Atlas in his day showed guys how they could get muscles behind their ears if they wanted them. You know, you can get muscles on the bottom of your feet. That, that he had to show people. There was a course in how to become muscular. Back in the 30s, there was a course called, uh, you remember, uh, Dave Miner's Piano Playing Course. Uh, I can remember this. It was on the radio all the time. It says, uh, why, uh, have you ever envied people who could play the piano like this? Well, you too can learn to play the piano with the new four-color magic slide rule chord-creating device. You don't have to know how to read music. You don't even have to know how to use your fingers. All you do is place this magic device over the keyboard, and within five minutes you're going... And by the end of the week, you add the left hand, the bass hand. Yes, and you too can become... Well, now that was another time. There's always a course to teach you how to become a superman of whatever the day and age requires of its supermen. And then as we got a little more sophisticated, the superman of knowledge came along. And uh, all over the radio, there were guys selling uh, five-foot shelves of fantastic compilations of all the knowledge in the world. There were guys going around, uh, knocking on doors, selling you encyclopedias. They were selling you world book of knowledge. They were selling you the knowledge of the world of the books and all the golden rules of all this. And, and there's many a basement filled with this stuff. Guys have long since given that up. Next to that, that, that collection of books, the gigantic five-foot shelf of glop, Next to that, there is an unused guitar, which was of another, or, or maybe a mandolin, which he could never learn to play, or a piano is down there in the basement. And then, then as we move very, very gradually into our time, naturally the courses on how to become a fantastic ego are necessary and are being bought by yucks all over the world. Be an ego! Don't bother to know anything! Don't bother to fool around with playing a piano. Don't bother to know anything about Thoreau. And as a matter of fact, it is well recognized that anyone with muscles is a cluck. Don't have muscles. The one thing you've got to have in this day and age, man, and you can have it. Just 15 minutes a day, seven days a week, you can be a massive ego. All right, gang. And uh, before we go on, speaking of egos, I don't know anybody more egotistical in general than the sales department. Allow them their brief moment in the sun here. Well, now, uh, if, you're, if you're curious, if you have not been hit by this particular thing, I'm sure that they'll start selling it to kids in the back. Wonderful thing to sell in Superman comics. Uh, <laughs> you didn't even feel that one, Maddie. It's a... Uh... <laughs> What do you what do you think what do you think for example James Bond represents? He's not muscular really, and he's totally inept. He's the worst detective or the worst uh, secret service man or whatever he is. He's the worst who ever existed. This guy's getting caught constantly. He can't do anything without seven guys grabbing him and throwing him in the back of the car and hitting him on the head. He just is bad, you know, just a, a terrible bad intelligence uh, officer. That's all. He's a rotten one. But he has one thing. He has a majestic ego. He has an ego that transcends all the bounds of reality. And for that reason, he is a popular hero of our day. He can't play the piano, as far as I know. He has never been known to think. Uh, certainly his, uh, his plots don't show it. 
Uh, <laughs> he, uh, he, he's, a, as a matter of fact, a terrible intelligence agent. But what he is is an ego. James Bond is convinced that James Bond stands at the very pinnacle of the entire world. And since, uh, you know, he's in charge of the plot, uh, James Bond then definitely does stand at the pinnacle of the world. Now, this is another kind of Superman. It's the Superman of ego. Uh, you'll find this man operating in many different areas. Now, today, you'll find him a popular novelist, where the novelist no longer writes novels. He writes about his problems in writing novels. Fantastic, unbelievable egos. Uh, Norman Mailer will come out and uh, write a whole series of articles advising the president how to solve all world problems. Just uh, uh, <laughs> and they call them the presidential papers of Norman Mailer. Uh, now, this, this is the transcendent ego, above and beyond all the bounds of normal, uh, rational behavior patterns. In other words, does he have to know anything about the Middle East to solve the Middle Eastern problem? Of course not. Not a, not a majestic ego. Of course not. Does James Bond have to know anything about the Kremlin to beat the Kremlin? Of course not. He's a giant ego and stands at the peak. Now, on the other hand, we have, we have the ego, of course, of uh, we find it in most popular arts. Have you noticed that, that there is a certain kind of ego now in the film world? Uh, this is the new underground film movement, who is totally above and beyond any criticism. It's impossible for you to criticize one of the new underground film creators, because he's beyond this. He's just, everything he does is, is great. Now, that is the thing that sets the ego, the total and the pure ego, off from the rest of us, is that he defines everything he does by definition, because he's done it, as superior. It is then and thenceforth and will always be the criteria by which others are judged. Uh, this, is, this, is the, this is the massive ego of our time. Now, have you run into any choruses in, in ego? You think they don't exist? Well, you just hang out. We'll be back in two minutes. Okay, how much time do we have, Lee? Oh, we've got plenty of time. Well, all right, because uh, this, this is a wild subject. <laughs> if you have never been approached by an ego salesman, I mean, you know, a salesman who wants to sell you a course in ego, then uh, you have not yet quite tasted the rich elixir of life in the mid-1960s. Now, understand a little bit more about what it's about. Have you ever envied Norman Mailer in his complete belief in himself? Have you ever envied, uh, uh, let's say, uh, James Baldwin in his complete belief in everything he says is, uh, is uh, true? That's it. Have you ever envied... Uh, Oh, uh, no, I, I don't have that. I wish I did. You see, I wouldn't be on the radio if I did. I'd be in an important medium, baby. Uh, <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever envied uh, people like Arthur Miller, who believe that every word he writes is pure gold? Uh, have you ever envied, envied people who, who, who have this, this, uh, this ability to totally transcend rationality and logic? Uh, have you ever envied Castro? Logic has nothing to do with Castro. Nothing, nothing whatsoever. Have you ever envied, uh, let's say, uh, somebody like, uh, well, Khrushchev is no longer with us as a top ego. I wonder what happens to a retired dictator when he sits around. You know, that must be very difficult. Uh, it really must be. Uh, think about the human situation. That would make a great play of the, of the dictator who at one point controlled the entire world, really. Anything he said, boo, the U.N. would quiver. And uh, he'd come out and he'd sneeze twice in the middle of a talk by Stevenson. And guys would write down uh, and the key to Khrushchev, uh, his attention drifting once again. This quite possibly could mean, and, you know, whatever he did was a fantastic. Now all of a sudden you're sitting there fishing. And nobody cares, you know, whether you catch one or not. It would be a tremendous, a wonderful play because it's a, it's a genuine problem. It is a, it's a human problem because this we find on all levels today. The deposed chairman of the board who used to run uh, General Motors, and now he finds that he's having trouble getting fishing worms, uh, and they're not delivering the milk on time, and little things like that, you know. It's a, it's a big problem. Now, not too long ago, I'm, I'm sitting at my desk, you know, and I get all kinds of junk delivered to me. I'm, I must be, I, I think eventually we will be able to tell a man, perhaps even now, by the mailing lists he's on, uh, have you ever wondered how you got on some of those nutty mailing lists of stuff that you get? In fact, I, I keep getting letters from someplace in Sweden 
they keep selling me uh, or sending me, they keep sending me catalogs of art films for connoisseurs. And <laughs> I don't know how I got on that one. I get the Swedish letter, you know, and I open it up, and it says, it says Dear Art Lover. Dear Connoisseur, now they don't even say Connoisseur of what, it's just, it's just a Dear Connoisseur, a special new collection of films that were turned out in Danish nudist colonies, are now available at yours at cut rates for connoisseurs all over the world. How the heck did I get on that list? Now what happened? It must go all the way back to the time I was nine when I surreptitiously sent in a coupon to an outfit in Kansas City that says 50 art photos. You must be 21 and an art student. I sent it off and I never got anything back from them, you know? <laughs> I'm still on the list. Now, I don't know how I got on the dictator list. I do not know how I got on that list, but I would like to read you very shortly an ad, right now, an ad, one of the most uh, telltale of all advertisements I've ever gotten and all the junk mail that comes in. You know, most of it is junk, but it really isn't in a sense. I think the stuff that we're bombarded by constantly, day and night, there must be 87 trillion tons of this stuff delivered every day to people all over the country. I think this stuff, this, this kind of monster dandruff, this stuff that's sort of drifting down out of, out of outer space, whatever all this stuff is, I think it tells a great deal about our world. I think it tells more about our world than our more self-conscious things, like editorials in the Times or serious considered articles in uh, Harper's Magazine about how people should love each other and how we should all get together and we should uh, be nice people, you know, this kind of stuff. I think the stuff that comes sneaking in there and it says, uh, special offer, it's a special offer. In the next 10 days, take advantage of this offer and save 20%. Wow. You open this thing up over your grapefruit and you're confronted by reality. And speaking of the advertisement world, all right, listen to this one now. I received this one. It was in, a, in, a, in an engraved envelope, very official-looking thing, say. And on the outside, it said, uh, had little official things. It said airmail and all that stuff on it, you know, so you'd be sure to open it. This is the new trick, is to send you things that look very, very official. They don't look like those flyers you used to get from P&G, you know, that said good for 10 cents off on Chipso, that kind of stuff. This gets right down to it. It says, Mr. Executive, your ego is the most powerful and important force you own and is the only one that can carry you to the ultimate of achievement and completeness. Yet it is also your greatest and most untapped capacity. It is now time that you learn to unleash this tremendous, fantastic life force, your ego. Get after him. Go out and get him! Through the mastery and exercise of ego efficacy, you can do just that. A new science that will carry you to the top. Yes, this course offers you for the first time an opportunity to develop and achieve that ultimate of selfness that gives you the capacity for hitherto unattainable effectiveness, individuality, and super stature. In all social, business, and <laughs> other human relationships. Through putting into practice instantly the first bits of the greatest force known, ego dynamics. This program magically changes you and your life the very first day and actually overnight elevates you to heights, status, and respect that were unachievable the day before. Yes, ego efficacy has always been the most sought and most elusive of all things that man has craved. Without it, job success, financial success, and love, and all other successes are incomplete and unsatisfying, but you can have it tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, you can dawn a new man. From childhood on, each person like you visualizes himself as someday attaining an aura of majesty and dignity that will mysteriously and compellingly cause others to admire, respect, and defer to him on sight. 
You've always wanted that, haven't you? <laughs> yes. He, like you, dreams of this quality and knows there is such a one. For as the years go along, he sees an occasional person who possesses this rarity. But no matter how much he himself strives for it, or hopes for it, it always eludes him. Despite these things, this quality, ego efficacy, the capacity of self alone to achieve infinite power is not an unattainable one. And anyone with a desire to rise above his current social, business equals, and superiors, and possessed of will to rule himself and others, can achieve it once he knows. The secret principles which we will outline to you. The secrets of efficacy were for centuries reserved exclusively for the royal born and tutored intensively to only a cautiously selected few of these. Yes, the acquiring of true ego efficacy developed those few into very special and unforgettable personages who ranked throughout history to identify them as what they were even when they sojourned incognito. People knew here was a king. Here was Genghis Khan. Here was a ruler. You too, tomorrow, can have such majesty and dignity, a majesty and dignity so emanative of ego dynamics that all persons automatically place and regard you as above themselves infinitely. Oh! Holy smokes! Oh boy! Once you acquire ego efficacy, persons, business, social, family, and others who have taken you for granted or who have ignored you will look up to you and see you on a plane that they themselves aspire to only in their wildest dreams. Employees, associates, colleagues, clients, friends, neighbors, even total strangers will see you, hear you, respect you, defer to you, be attentive to you, and notice you in a way they have never before. Miraculously, they will suddenly regard you as a newly important man to them. You will take on an impressive individuality, and never again will you be just another someone. Executive, associate, traveler, diner, stranger, acquaintance to anyone. Your presence alone, without even a word from you, will command and influence all who see you. Even those who have no knowledge whatsoever of your name, your finances, your occupational plane, or social status, forever and increasingly, you will be somebody special. And you will be that somebody special to every last living soul you encounter. Contrary to the common belief of most who yearn but do not strive for ego efficacy. The secret of it is not born genius or an inborn gift. It is a developable capacity. You can develop the muscles behind your ears. You can learn to play the piano. You can learn what Perot said that day many years ago. And you can also truly be one of exceedingly special quality. And in just a few weeks time, friends, Yes, our series of lectures, discussions, and mail-order question-and-answer periods and printed guides and reference material will carry you to the heights that only kings and great rulers of the past knew, that very special status of individual capacity that you want, with a phenomenal magic of their own, unbelievable, before having experienced it. These new students begin their transformation. You can begin it, and others' awareness of it, even before you are even yourself aware that it has begun. In fact, experience has proved that no one, we repeat, no one, can be exposed to ego dynamics, 
not even partially, without automatic elevation resulting. Immediately, instantaneously, you will be carried to the height. Mail now, you must be satisfied. Ten day trial period. <laughs> Holy smokes. Listen, I read that, I, my eyeballs were sweating. I'll tell you, not since I decided to stop being a 97-pound weakling have <laughs> Now, I did not change a word. I read this exactly. It sounds like, I mean, you know, this is a, I, I received this thing. Now, it seems to me that what this is a correspondence course on how to be Hitler. It really does, <laughs> you know. It sounds to me like a correspondence course on how to become Castro. And uh, I, I, I felt, you know, gee, wow, we, this is, this is a fantastic. I wonder how I got on this mailing list, you know. Boy, it's a pretty rotten thing. And uh, oh, by the way, they also have an advanced course called Advanced Principles. That's for guys who want to go beyond just being foreman. This is, uh, oh boy, isn't that exciting? It really is, yeah. Oh, I, it's got it all down there. I thought, <laughs> well, I got this thing in the mail, you know, and I, I thought to myself, well, you know, this is a very official place. It's got, it's got uh, engraved stationery and everything else. I figured, gee whiz, you know, uh, maybe this says a little more about why we have dictators than, say, uh, the editorial page of the New York Times does. I suspect it might possibly uh, have a little green there of something there. Uh, you'll admit that hearing this, it kind of got you a little excited, didn't it, friend? Uh, I'll, I'll train it on for size now. Seriously, now. See yourself tomorrow morning standing in front of the mirror. And suddenly, there develops in that eye of yours that watery orb. That, 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 uh, that, that watery nothing that you've been carrying around in your knob. Suddenly, there develops that piercing, stealing gaze of a man who says, without any hesitation in his voice, Follow me! And they follow. Yes. Well, now, come on, friend. Come on, now. Be there a man with soul so dead who never to himself has said, Oh, boy. Oh, man. Oh. Oh. Wouldn't you just love to see yourself standing on a balcony surrounded by 394 microphones? The whole world wants to hear your every word. Flash bulbs going off all around. 400 guys, your bodyguard, to keep you from your multitude of enemies. Of course, they are the forces of evil. And there you stand, overlooking all of mankind. Follow me! And they do. Holy smokes. That's better than kicking sand in guys' eyes. My George. That's a heck of a lot better than sitting down and playing uh, Jada on the piano. I'll tell you that. And uh, that's a lot better. It's a lot more fun than quoting Schopenhauer. You don't have all the chicks fall over themselves at the cocktail party. Who oh, follow me! I am going to lead all of you. There you stand in front of the mirror in your John somehow surrounded by the robes of majesty, a great ermine cape flung over your shoulder, the diamond and gold-studded hilt of your traditional sword of office gleaming at your side in its brocade. There he stands, the king. Holy smokes. Good heavens. <laughs> Well, uh, I can hardly wait, huh? Well, I just sent my coupon in yesterday. I suppose it's a little too early to expect it to start coming. Well, I can tell you this, friends, that you can definitely look forward to a tremendous improvement of this program within a very short time. Definite improvement. Let's see, it says, uh, uh, you begin your transformation and others' awareness of it even before you yourself are conscious of it. It's already begun. So in the next couple of weeks, if you find yourself fantastically drawn to your radio and you find yourself down on your knees in front of it, well, <laughs> it's working. I'd like to get some notes on that. Uh, I'd like to hear how it's doing out there with you. And oh, it's a, it's a, experience has proved 
that no one can be exposed to this fantastic power without even partially, automatically, his elevation resulting. I suspect that that means my rating will go up, huh? Automatically there, huh? The first exposure begins the generation of a new self. I'll, right here in front of your very eyes, in front of your very earballs. I'll start turning into a new self. With these, you suddenly discover you have acquired a new effective power, uh, even while they're at their smallest and just beginning. Oh, I kind of like this. It says, even while these little, little guide marks are small and just beginning, they will give me a mark that others admire and envy and that you, of course, will guard and cherish. I wonder whether or not uh, it has anything to do with the working on crinkly lines around the eyes. You think it has anything to do with that? You think it has something to do with it? It must, yeah. It says, uh, uh, it says oh, by the way, it says, uh, people are carefully selected for this fantastic power. Uh, I thought you might want to know this. If, you, if you're thinking of taking it, Matt, I'll just say you may not make it. It says here that we very carefully select these people because it's a very dangerous power to unleash. It says that they have carefully selected me from over 100,000 applicants, and they have designated me as one who should... I, I'm, you know, I'm a responsible person, and uh, they recognize the true beauty and worth of my soul, even from the very beginning. So if you are thinking of taking this, you may not make it. You know, those guys that sold those courses to kick sand, and, and that's the trouble with those guys. They just sold them anybody that came. You know, and a lot of guys turned out to be trigger men, and knuckle men, and everything else, you know, after taking the course. And they didn't just stick around the beach there. They went around and hit guys' heads together. So, uh, well, one other thing it says here, uh, I think it's important, too, to realize. It says, uh, and this is very important. Uh, it says that it's not something that uh, you can't learn. That's important to me, you know. It says, because uh, after all, I know who I am. And I know that I do not have the inborn genius of Genghis Khan. It says, however, that uh, you can develop this capacity if you work hard at it. Now, I wonder if you stand in front of the mirror and you holler, follow me. Uh, how is this done? Well, I'll keep you abreast of it, friends. Although I, sus I suppose that I must, as they say here, jealously guard the secrets. So you won't know that. I would suggest, however, that a few of you out there buy some knee pads. You're going to spend a lot of your time on your knees in front of the radio, friends, after I start getting this chorus under full swing. Yes, there is a new shepherd on the way. A new shepherd. A new dynamic shepherd who will say, follow me, and by God, they will. 